All right, should we go ahead and get started? Looks like we're still waiting for a few. We'll just wait an extra minute just for people to come on in and then we'll get started. Go ahead and get started. All right, so Welcome to the American Academy of Emergency Medicine Women in Emergency Medicine section. This is a virtual mentoring series uh, for osteopathic uh, me medical students. So my name is Caroline Twum, and I will be moderating tonight's session as well as Katie. Um, I'll be doing the intro and then she'll be taking over um, after that. So I would like to review housekeeping items before we get started. Um, so today's session will be recorded and it will be uploaded to the AAEM WIEM's website within 24 hours. So expect that um, if you wanna look back at it or if you have to leave early or anything. Um, tonight's session is meant to be interactive. So please, please, please use a Q and A function if you would like, a, if you would like to ask a question or you, you would like to uh, make a comment. Um, we welcome and encourage your participation. Um, does anyone have any questions so far about anything that I've said? Otherwise we can keep going. Okay. All right, um, so I'm curious, take a moment now to tell us where you're from by providing a welcome message in your city and state in the chat box if you would like, and just tell us a little bit about yourself. And also think of questions to ask. <laughs> um, from Texas, hey. <laughs> All right, so today I have the privilege to introduce our panelists. So panelists, as I introduce you, please come on the screen. Um, so first we have Alika Fernandez, Dr. Alika Fernandez, uh, PGY1 at Emory University Emergency Medicine, also ACOEP, RSO Media Chair. So Dr. Alika Fernandez is a first year resident at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. She attended medical school at Kansas City University. She is passionate about mentoring EM bound medical students, particularly those who attend osteopathic medical schools. In her free time, you can probably find her whipping up a feast from scratch or at a brewery with her husband and Golden Doodle Gambino. <laughs> All right, so that is Dr. Fernandez. So now we're going to introduce Dr. Christina Hornack. Uh, hi, Dr. Hornack. <laughs> Dr. Hornack is originally from Pittsburgh and came to medicine as a second career. Uh, through medical training, she discovered her love for small towns and now serves as a full-time Nocturnist at a single coverage rural critical access hospital as an emergency medicine specialist in Chillicothe, I probably butchered that, Ohio. Um, in her spare time, she enjoys historical reenactments, home remodeling, and video games. She resides with her husband and the world's most spoiled dog in Southern Ohio. So that is Dr. Hornack. Next, we have Dr. Megan Gallagher, um, Associate Residency Program Director. Um, from Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia. Uh, so Dr. Stobart currently serves as the Associate Residency Program Director at Thomas, Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She's a proud graduate of VCOM Virginia campus and completed her residency at Einstein Medical Center. Um, she has served as a fourth year clerkship director prior to residency leadership and loves to mentor students in EM both locally and over distance. She just had a baby boy on July 18th, congratulations, <laughs> and is enjoying some time at home with her now three kids before returning to work in October where ERAS and interview season await her. So that is Dr. Gallagher. Uh, next, we are introducing Dr. Deborah Pierce. Um, she's a residency program director, Department of Emergency Medicine at Einstein Healthcare Network in Philadelphia. So Dr. Pierce is the program director at Einstein, has been the program director at Einstein for the past five years. Um, she did residency in, at Einstein, then worked at Cooper for seven years as APD, then back to Einstein, left to work in the community for a few years, then back to Einstein as an APD and now PD. Uh, just completed two years as medical staff president and now chair of credentials committee. Outside of work, she has two daughters, um, both in college and loves to play tennis. So, panelists, the floor is yours. Um, we can start off with Dr. Fernandez. Um, tonight's topic is about residency, as we all know. So what advice do you have for medical students? And this is going for the panelists. And Katie is gonna take over after this. 
Uh, my one piece of advice about ERAS or like everything? Yeah, so if you had one takeaway before you submit your ERAS or before you did submit your ERAS, what would you say? Okay, so I know that all of you have read it a million times, but I need you to print out your application and then read it out loud for spelling and grammatical errors. Don't just read it quietly to yourself. You got to read it out loud because if you're like me, you probably skim over words and uh, <laughs> make some mistakes. So print it out, grab a marker, read through it, and then have someone else read through it out loud so you don't miss any mistakes because attention to detail is very important in emergency medicine. I, I would um, agree with that 100%. You do not want to have typos in your application. I actually had somebody tell me that one of the ways to do it was to read it backwards so that your brain doesn't do that thing where if you look at two letters, you'll make the word and it'll look fine. Um, so actually go from the last, you know, read it up backwards and that lets you pick up um, errors better, but ideally let somebody else read it if you can, and they'll pick up if you missed, you know, misspelled something or, or a comma or something like that. I think at this point with all of you either have submitted already or are waiting to push the button, take a breath. It's okay. It's going to be on a paper. It's going to get printed out. People are going to look at it, but that's not who you are. You know, everything that comes after you hit that submit button will be much better. I think there's a lot of pressure on ourselves on, on, you know, we put on each other to make sure your ERAS is perfect, but we can tell you when it prints out, it's just 20 pages of words. Um, and we have to put it together, looking at the important sections, you know, your, it's it's an entire application, not just one section is more important than the other. So, um, you know, be proud of what you've put, no matter what it is, um, and just be you. That's the most important thing, I think, is we want you. We don't want who you're pretending to be. Um, I guess my tip is if you're going to put something in your application, um, or in your personal statement or something, you should know something about that. Um, I remember I was in an interview when we were interviewing students and it was very uncomfortable because this student had put some honorary society that he was a member of that my attending physician who I was sitting next to at the time was also a member of. And this kid knew nothing about this society. And, you know, that's fine. We all join things to like be part of something and have all that leadership stuff. But like, have some talking points about everything on your application. Because if you're just putting it because you did this and you paid the thing and you never paid attention, like that can sometimes hurt you. And I don't think this kid was expecting that. And it was probably like the worst five minutes of his life because apparently there was like a whole song and a pledge and the kid didn't know any of it. And my attending definitely did. So Those are all really great pieces of advice. So going off of um, what Dr. Stobart said, apologies if I pronounce any of your names wrong, um, but what was the most important part, if you can remember, of your ERAS versus what do you think the most important part as a program or the people reading it are looking at? I think that the, the latter part of your question the, can be very program specific if you're trying to build a class or like an ideal kind of group of people. Um, I think the thing I probably put the most time in when I applied a few, a few years ago um, was my personal statement. And I think that people overemphasize how much time they spend on their personal statement. Um, we can tell you from reading them that probably 90% are almost identical. Uh, we love emergency medicine because of X, Y, and Z. I love teamwork. I love this. I love that. So I think that we 
spend a lot of time thinking about how important, how am I going to stand out with my personal statement? Um, and if you truly do stand out and you explain a red flag, for example, or you tell an interesting story about when you lived on a farm and you burst a cow, like I'm, that's going to catch my attention, right? I mean, that was someone last year, they burst a cow. I'll never forget that. Um, but I think that that was the thing I stressed out the most about. And now looking back, that's only just a small piece of what I look at when I review applications. Um, I don't know, so I'm talking a lot, I'll let the other panelists speak. Um, I, when I'm looking at your application, I'm looking for things that tell me something about you and whether or not you, and I'm trying to figure out whether or not you would be somebody who would enjoy being <clears throat> at Einstein for the next four years for your training. And that is, um, somebody who has certain personality traits that I think I've identified as people who do, who enjoy being in this program and who do well in the program and who work well with the other residents, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm trying to figure out who you are and I, I want you to try to let me know who you are. So I figure that out by seeing things like your, um, your, scholarly work, your hobbies, your um, volunteer activities. Um, and But also I do look at your personal statements and I try to get a feel for who you are in your personal statements. So I think that um, what Dr. Stobart was saying that they're all the same. I, you know, I, I don't need you to say that you love emergency medicine, but if you can put, you know, tell me something about you that, that lets me know you, that you're comfortable saying, that will help me figure out if you're somebody that I think would be, um, you know, happy at Einstein. I want residents that are going to be happy at our program because that's what creates positive energy and, um, and cohesiveness and all that kind of stuff. So, um, it's as important for us to figure out if you're right for us as for you to figure out if we're right for you. And you have to remember that through the whole process and it starts with your application and then extends through interviews and the whole thing. So, um, so just try to communicate what you want us to know about you and that's through your application, but it's also true once you get into interviews. I haven't reviewed applications because I'm an intern, um, but I will tell you, I spent a lot of time on my hobby section and it paid off because someone always had some something to ask about my hobbies because, you know, like every interviewer will ask you like a serious question or like specifically point something out on your application. Like I had my pediatric research get brought up from undergrad, which was crazy to me, but they were really interested in it because they were a PZM person. Um, but then they were also able to bring something up that was in my hobbies. Um, and that'll help uh, with the lulls because we know that it can be a little awkward. Zoom interviews can be awkward. So if you spend some time on your hobbies so that um, that could be something that uh, someone can use as a talking point, or like Dr. Pierce said, uh, to get to see if you uh, have hobbies or you would fit well um, with the other residents. I know at the time, like one of the things that I talked about in my interview was I was like really into Game of Thrones and I did a fantasy Game of Thrones where you would like pick your characters and then you get points for stuff. And we ended up talking about it in the interview and I matched there. So, you know, like, I think that like, we're all worried about being whatever the program's looking for. I think the thing to keep in mind is that you too are looking for a program 
And you should not be trying to fit what they are looking for. You should be trying to find the program that fits you because this is your education. I know you want to match. You're going to match. Um, but like find the program where you're going to flourish and be happy and be joyful because then you're going to be the best that you can be. You know, that sounds like really hokey or whatever, but that's what I got. It's not hokey. Fantasy Game of Thrones. I'm, I'm intrigued. <laughs> um, so going back to the specific parts of the application, say you are a candidate that has a red flag, say you failed a course or needed to even repeat the year. Um, how do you go about broaching that in your application? Um, so this is where you use your personal statement, um, but you basically, you know, what happened, you know, that you were in a car wreck, someone passed away, you were having a rough time. This is, I didn't pass my boards on step one, you know, the first time because of X, Y, and Z. I learned blah, 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 blah from it. Move on. Don't spend your entire statement explaining it away or, or kind of dwelling on it. Um, but it is important to explain, you know, another red flag would be, you know, you had been arrested for something in the past, um, a failure of something. Um, leave of absences are not always red flags. Um, they can be really beneficial for people. Um, but if your application just, you know, your dean's letter or your transcript just has leave of absence without an explanation about why, um, that would be good to explain there as well. Um, but I would, I would not dwell on it. I would take a brief time to explain it, what you learned from it, where you've gone from there, um, and then kind of focus on all the positives in your application. I also got a tip from someone um, that if you have a red flag or something that you want to discuss that does you don't know exactly where to put it in your application, the hobbies box is a free for all box. So you could use that free text box to uh, write whatever you want. You know, if you want to just list a couple hobbies and if you need something, you need to explain something and it doesn't quite fit in your personal statement, I was told that that was a good place to put it. Um, just my two cents. Hmm. Yeah, I would follow up from what Megan said and, and I don't think you, you don't want to dwell on things, but you definitely don't want to try to hide things. So it's way better. Nobody is perfect. Nobody. And everybody has different issues, but most everybody, if not everybody, has some issue somewhere. And, you know, we all deal with family tragedies at one time or another, um, illness, you know, sometimes physical, you know, problems, depression, that kind of stuff. And, you know, there's lots of really great EM docs out there that have had to figure out how to manage their depression or their whatever. So it, if you need to take a leave of absence, you don't have to go and explain that it was because you're depressed or something like that. But, but it will show up that if it took you five years to graduate from medical school because you had a leave of absence, um, that's going to be something that I'm going to wonder why it took five years instead of four years. So an example is I spoke to a student today who had um, failed part one of his boards and his medical school had him somehow he had to take like a four month leave of absence and that caused him to not graduate until the following year and you know sometimes we see people that stick a master's in there and it's because they've failed a course or something like that um if there's something just explain it and as Megan said you know say you know, I realized this, I learned this and move on. And that is, um, that's how I would approach it. But I would be forthcoming with it and not with anything that's going to look 
out of normal. So, you know, again, the delay in graduation date or, or failure or um, I think a leave of absence is, is okay unless it causes you to graduate late. And then it looks like there could have been an academic problem. So you might want to explain that a little bit. Um, you don't have to get too personal, but just kind of anything that would strike us as not normal, I think I would try to explain, but then move on. And then, you know, this is what I learned from it. And now, you know, this is how I've applied things or changed things or whatever. But don't feel like you're the only person who has had whatever issue you've had, because I can pretty much guarantee to you that you are not the only person with that issue and certainly not the first or the last. I think Dr. Pierce's point about making sure you address it and not ignore it is really important because if it's not addressed, whatever it is somewhere, then it remains a red flag. It gets even brighter. It's like the hurricane flag with a little design on it now. Um, and you don't want to have to be confronted with it on an interview. You would much rather have it already out in the open because um, that actually may be the key to getting you an interview. Wow, this person's overcome adversity. They're mature. They've had life experience. You know, they they will be able to sustain the rigors of residency, things like that. So, um, you know, talking about what you've learned from it can actually really be beneficial for you. If you have a question about whether or not you have a red flag, make sure you ask someone. Um, I don't, I'm going to just volunteer everybody here, but if you don't have anybody to ask, because you're a DO student and you don't have good advising at your school, please message one of us, preferably the attendings because they know what they're doing and I do not, but please reach out to somebody and ask because I did not have good advising at my school. I did not know if I, my red flag was a red flag. So I asked somebody about it and they were like, oh no, you're good. So make sure you ask. It, now is not the time to be shy. Okay, if we don't have any more um, comments on the red flag. I think that was a really good discussion, um, especially with the advising comment. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez, for bringing that up. I know that going to um, DO schools um, may, some schools may not have the best advising in certain areas, so it is really helpful to, um, to have someone to reach out to. So we had a question um, in the chat box. I'm just going to read it out loud. Um, is it reasonable to submit your application with one slow and add an O slow and with a slow and an O slow, then add a second slow in early November? Yeah, I'll, I'll start with that one. Absolutely. So, so what I find that some students do, um, who may not have very good advising, may not have people to talk to is they'll feel like they have to fill all four slots right away off the bat when you submit your application. And it is way more valuable for us to have slows than general letters of recommendation. Now letters of recommendation can be very helpful if they're something kind of probably that you might not think of. Like if it was, if you did some awesome community service project and you have the person that you worked with that writes a letter for you or research and your research PI writes a letter for you or, or you develop some kind of, um, you know, medical school curriculum or you did something outside of your rotations. That can be very valuable. But as you can imagine, if you work, if you get a standard letter of recommendation, you're not gonna ask somebody that you worked with and had a bad rotation you're gonna ask somebody that you got along well with, that you liked, that liked you, and they're just always good. So they aren't very helpful in, in telling us anything about you specifically or differentiating you from anybody else um, because they're just always good. So 
it's fine to put in a letter of recommendation or, or maybe two, but if you are gonna have two slows, that's very much more helpful. And if it's gonna come in November, it's still early enough in the application season that people will be reviewing applications potentially, or you know, further reviewing an application that might be put on hold or something like that. And then finally, there's two places that I use slows. One is to determine initial invites, and the other is when we do the match list. So if people have late slows, that still can influence for us where they go on our match list. So they're not, it's not wasted, if you will, if you um, have a slow in November, December, you know, December and January might be getting a little bit late to get invites for interviews, but, um, but they're still useful for the match list. So I would leave a spot open for sure and submit your November slow whenever that gets in, in that open slot and just fill the other three slots with your O slow and your slow and then something, whatever other letter recommendation you're gonna do. But don't fill it with three letters of recommendation because you only have one slow and like, you know, a psych letter, a peds letter, whatever. It's, I would not do that because that's not going to help you. I have a follow up questions for you, Dr. Pierce, because I'm sure people tuning in um, are wondering this question. What do the programs see when you uh, send in that? November slow, do you get a notification or should the applicant message the program and let you know that they updated their application? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. That's a great question. I would 100% send an email to the program director um, for any program that you're very interested in going to and um, you didn't get an invite to yet. Um, if you were invited for an interview, then don't worry about it because you can tell them when you go on the interview that you uploaded another slow, they'll probably ask you about it. Um, so I wouldn't, I would just wait for your interview in that case, because it's not gonna change anything. I'm not, if I invite you for an interview, I'm not going back and reviewing your app again until right before the interview. And then I'll talk to you about your slow during the interview. Um, but. If you, if I reviewed your application and I thought, oh, it's a maybe and put you on hold, or if I didn't get to your application yet, if I get an email from you saying I just uploaded another slow and I um, really would, am very interested in Einstein's program because my, you know, family lives in Philadelphia and I would love an opportunity to interview with you. You know, I'm going to see that email and I'm going to look at your application because it's going to be the trigger for me to go look at the application. And if it's something I put on hold for another slow, then that's going to get me to look at it. That's going to prompt me to look at it. So I would not make it a dramatically lengthy email, one or two lines, just maybe expressing why you would love to have an interview with the program and just a heads up. Um, I put my slow, you can do the same thing if you take part two of your boards. So um, whether you take level two, um, you know, and, it, and your scores come back and you haven't heard from a program that you really are interested in, it's okay to email that program director and say, just wanted to let you know that I just uploaded my score for level two and you know, it may be the prompt you need for them to look at your application. I think, I personally believe that that's fair game. And I can tell you when I get those emails, I look at every one of them. So again, don't be shy. Don't be shy, but Dr. Right. Pierce's <laughs> point of one to two sentences, yes. one time. Yeah. People's, yeah, Deb, you're on mute. <laughs> the, I, you know, <laughs> Megan and I worked together for a lot of years, so we know each other. It's like, oh my gosh. Um, yeah, you, you know, two lines is good 
and you don't want to be too much of a nudge, but I don't think that, yeah, yeah, you don't want to email constantly, but <laughs> just leave it at that. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Well, and, and I would say just in terms of communication, once you hit that ERAS button, um, the program coordinators can break break your application if you send them a deluge of emails like all the time like you know our coordinator will be like this person has sent me 15 emails here's their application like will you please look at it and make a decision because they're driving me crazy and that automatically to us is like oh our program coordinator coordinator wouldn't be able to work with that person so it, it can be really concerning because your life will depend on your program coordinator <laughs> so just be mindful of your communication. Make it purposeful. But you know, the other thing to do, and I was having this conversation with a student today. If you are a person who has, you know, something in your application that's concerning, or you know, a red flag, or you know, you failed boards or, you know, something that might end up having your application just kind of screened out at a program that doesn't know you. And you had, you know, a tra family tragedy when you failed part one and part two, you or you did great on or something like that. There are screens for the applications. And we, when you get a lot of applications, you have to start somewhere. So most programs figure out kind of what they do to start with the initial batch of applications to review. If you find that you're not getting interviews or you're not getting interviews at programs that are very important to you, if you have a mentor um, in emergency medicine, you know, there are times that I might, you know, shoot, Megan an email and say, hey, I have this student that rotated with me. He was spectacular. He failed part one because of a family tragedy, but he was really an exceptional student and would love to go to Jefferson. Can you just take a look at his application? And she may have not looked at his application because she doesn't know him. She doesn't know anything about him. And she saw the board failure and thought that's something that I'm, I'm gonna move on right now from. But a heads up from me would have her look at the application and then she would understand there's gotta be something special about this guy if Deb sent me an email about him. So maybe I'll take a look at him. Utilizing your mentors for that kind of thing also is important. So don't, Feel like you have to be on an island with all this. It's okay to talk to people and it's okay to kind of figure out how to navigate what's okay to do, what's not, um, and um, things work out. Last year, um, there were, I don't, I got a bunch of emails from program directors all around the country saying, you know, my student one of our students only got four interviews and he's an excellent candidate. We're not sure why he got four interviews, but we, if anybody has any interview space, we take a look at his application. And, you know, that kind of thing is not uncommon at all for us to communicate between the PDs and APDs. So don't hesitate to reach out to people. So Dr. Pierce, on the flip side of that comment, um, you were talking about maybe a student who emails a program 20 times, or maybe you see something that is a red flag. Would you say it's common for program directors to communicate about maybe not so great candidates to other programs, or is that not as common? I think I you're think on I mute. I have to zoom thing down by now. Um, It, that I don't think, I'm just trying to think and answer that question honestly. I, I don't think I ever 
have told another program director uh, that, a, that a student was an issue ever unsolicited. I mean, I don't even know that there's a time that I've had another program director or APD or friend call me and say, do you know anything? I, you know what, actually, if I had a student, like if I had a student that rotated with Megan and in the slow, there is wording that would be a red flag for me. So when they write the evaluation of the student, they write something like, you know, something that insinuates that the student had an issue of some kind, either a personality issue or, you know, a they're overly cocky or they're whatever. It, there are certain red flags that we see in the slows. And there are times that I'll call a program director and just say, you know, is this really a red flag or was it just maybe not the greatest choice of words or whatever? Not often, but maybe once or twice. Um, but I would never, I would never call and say, and blackball a student to multiple people. And I don't think that I've ever, I've never even seen that when students have like done, like lied or done illegal things, that would be the thing that if anything would prompt communication. But now I don't think I've ever seen that. Megan, have you ever seen that? No, I was, I was just gonna add like, it's only been if people have asked me directly about it and then you still try to be as like politically correct and even as possible because we want you all to succeed yeah. uh -huh. um no one is a bad person some people have done things that are questionable but um you know it is not our job to tell other people what to expect from you um that's that's up to you guys um, so yeah, I mean, even if people have been like, oh, someone wrote, you know, this so-and-so was overbearing or whatever in their slow. And then you say, you know, there was just, a, you know, one attending didn't get along with the student. They didn't see eye to eye. There were no issues reported. Um, you know, they're very solid. You know, you just keep it as, it's not our job, like Deb said, to blackball people. We want you to be successful. And remember, just because you aren't, you know, loved at one place, you know, this goes back to what Chris, um, Dr. Hornack and Dr. Fernandez were saying, you have to love the program too. Just because some place that you think you're going to love, it's like your dream program, you may end up hating it. You may end up hating the people. Um, and you have to just be open-minded and find where you fit, not that they fit you. Back to Katie's question, I think there's a lot of fear mongering online and amongst EM students. Um, I was listening to the fear mongering last year, so I was right there with all of you. And now that I'm on this side of things, I've let, literally asked everyone I possibly can, like every faculty I possibly can, these, um, threads, messaging threads, and email chains, and these don't exist, like Dr. Pierce and Dr. Stobart Gallagher just said. They don't exist, um, as far as we know. As far as kind people know, <laughs> they don't exist. So um, be very careful what you read online. There's a lot of fear mongering. Look to people who you can trust. That's a really, really great point. Um, we don't read those threads. We don't have time for that. Um, the ones that I have read, it, like it's like someone said, oh, they mentioned Jefferson in the comments. I'm like, oh, let me see what they said about my program. Not what you guys are saying about each other. But then I do see these students, I got 7,000 on my boards and 45 interviews. And I'm like, don't just turn it off. Don't go on Reddit don't go on student doctor. I don't even know that still exists, right? Student doctor, like don't even go on Twitter because people on Twitter and Instagram have started posting, you know, people were posting pictures of their interview invites last year and stuff like just go into a vacuum. Like it's not about everybody else. 
<laughs> stay off. And yet we don't, we don't have listservs to talk about you guys. We don't. Yeah, we, we do not. Two, we get 2000 applications, you know, for however many spots each year, like, we, we have to work clinically, like we have our families. We don't have time to be talking about you guys online. No offense. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I'm gonna just echo if I can and elaborate something that Megan just said. So, you know, social media can be great, but it can also be very not great. And it can really mess with your mind. It can make you feel bad about yourself. It can um, cause depression. It can do all those things. This is not the time to go on Twitter and compare yourself to other people. I mean, I, I can tell you that there have been one or two occasions that I've gone on Twitter and seen something about Dr. Stobart. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm such a loser. Look at what great things she's doing and I'm doing nothing. I mean, like, you know, you and Megan and I worked together for years and, you know, that's just not, it, it's irrational or it's like, just you get in that wigged out brain set or whatever, but don't, don't do it. Just don't look. It's not a competition. It's not, you know, there's nothing that's gonna be purposeful about that. Just trust the process, trust that things work out the way they're supposed to, and, um, and just be the best you you can be. You know, it is, don't look at what people who are touting their, some, their selves on Twitter are saying, because often that's not, doesn't even reflect correctly sometimes who they are. So um, yeah, I would stay away from social media right now. I think it has the power to do damage and not really be beneficial at this stage of the game. And to this point, we also don't have time to look up, look you guys up on Facebook. Like we don't do that either. Um, I don't usually have time to Google you. Now, if you put something in your hobbies about your band or your YouTube or your blog or your foodie Instagram, I'm totally looking that up the night before interviews. Um, so we can talk about your chicken Parmesan Instagram that someone had last year. Literally, it was just only pictures of chicken parm. It's amazing. Um, the other thing, yeah, to Dr. Hornack's point that she just put in the chat, do not put stuff that people could screenshot and use against you. Also, don't talk badly about programs. Um, don't talk badly about the residents. If you, you know, you meet somebody, um, either stay off of it or just stay positive. Yes, patience. Stop yeah, that now. I, don't talk about I, patience at all, ever again. Never, ever. I would, I would not ever talk about a program even if you even if you felt like a program really did something egregious I, I don't I wouldn't put that out there because people don't want to feel like they're gonna be I, I don't know I think that would only reflect poorly on you if you went and complained about another program and and things do get tagged so you, those kinds of things end up coming back to us one way or another. Um, there was, um, what was the first thing you said that I'm um, like, don't complain about other programs. And then what were you saying, Megan, what did you just say before that? My fatigued brain. I don't remember. <laughs> you're worse than... <laughs> Uh, you're oh, younger God. than me. You're supposed to remember. Um, I think she was saying like looking people up on Facebook. Oh yeah, we don't have time. For that. Oh, 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 oh yeah. <laughs> no, looking at things. I don't even have Facebook. So I have to be honest with you. Yeah, I don't do Facebook, but I have to be honest with you. So if you put something very cool, interesting, like Megan talked about the band, I, I had a student who um, put in their publications a story that was published in their like um their college news journal thing and it was a poem it was described as a poem and I totally looked it up and it ended up being like this really cool um artwork of a heart and whatever and then he the poem intertwined with it it, it was very 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 interesting and 
so incredibly artistic. And I, something about it pulled me in on his CV and I just, it caught my eye. I'm like, what is that? So if you, and there's maybe been one or two other times I've looked up a publication. So somebody has an interesting research project and something about it just strikes me as interesting. I'll go look it up. And sometimes I'll look it up before your interview so we can talk about it during your interview. So somebody mentioned before, know what's on your CV and be able to talk about it. Cause if you have a publication there that I look up and I read the publication and talk about it during the interview for whatever reason, um, it's, you know, you want to be able to talk about it. But I actually showed this person, I, I like held up the picture of the heart and I'm like, so tell me about this. He's like, are you kidding? You got my poem from college. I'm like, yeah, it's pretty cool. So um, did, tell me about it. So, and um, so realize that if, if something catches our eye, we might look for it. So I, if I had a, Oh. has a question. Sorry, I was just going to open it up and say if any of the participants have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. We want to answer the rest of your remaining burning questions in the next few minutes. Okay, yeah, I had a couple of questions. I guess I'll go one by one so we don't lose track of them. Um, so the first one was like, um, I, I guess I'm like a latecomer. I really wanted to do emergency medicine like after my third year rotation was done. So in terms of like my preclinical activities, I don't really have a lot of like EM stuff on like my ERAS application. So I guess um, what are some ways that like if I end up not getting as many interviews or anything like that, like how can I reach out to programs and um, like who should I reach out to? Is it the program director or the program coordinator um, for whatever reason if I'm in like a tight situation like that? Um, so it kind of depends on the program region, kind of things like that. So if, if you have specific programs that you're really interested in right off the bat, even before they start sending out interviews, like Dr. Pierce mentioned, you know, I'm hoping to end up in this geographical region because my family's here. I'm a latecomer to EM, but I'm really passionate about a short three to four sentence email to the program director can get your name on their list to look at their app, at the application. Um, most people don't filter by number of volunteer activities or number of community service things or anything like that. So, um, and not everybody has a lot of EM activities. A lot, some people focused on, you know, their other passions or they focused on studying for the first two years. There's nothing wrong with that. Not everybody has been an EMRA president or any of these other things. So don't worry about that too much. So, and I'll even go further with, I have had residents who have been like the president of the ortho club or the, you know, some, being OBGYN and, you know, or done three years of ortho research before they went to medical school or during medical school or something like that. So, you know, it is not, I don't think that I would really worry about the fact that you don't have a lot of EM pre-medical school. It's fine to figure it out. I did a year of OB before emergency medicine. I thought I wanted to be an OBGYN and then switched into emergency medicine. So, you know, try, if you need to do that, do that. Try not to do that though. It's much harder than it was when I did it now than when I did it. But um, I would not let that stress me out. I wouldn't, it's probably not any big deal. And um, it's, it's probably more of you worrying about it than us worrying about it. Great, thank you. You said you had another question? Um, yeah, so I guess like if um, like we are um, having, you know, like, so in my situation, I have one slow that I'm going to be sending out and then the others are going to be uploaded um, like whenever I get them along the, the interview um, season. So who should I email for the new slows that are uploaded? Is it the program director or the program coordinator?
So you can actually send a message through ERAS, like once your application is submitted and it will go, to, at least in our program, it goes to our program coordinator. And then Lori will forward your application to us to take a second look at, um, or to say, hey, so-and-so, we get those, once interview season starts, Lori kind of manages ERAS for us and lets us know. Um, but as Dr. Pierce mentioned earlier, like if it's somewhere that you're really gung-ho and haven't heard about interviews, um, you know, a two-line email to the program director is also reasonable. But the coordinators live and breathe ERAS for five months or whatever it is. So, um, and they're able to keep a lot more organized than, than I think we are. So. So there was a question in the chat. Um, what are some of those filters that programs um, use to sort through candidates? So there are, as you can imagine, the it, it's going to vary depending on the program and depending on, you know, what type of program you are, how long you've been around, et cetera, et cetera. But for an example, Megan described that they got 2000 applications last year. I think we got 1700, right? So you have to start somewhere with 1700 applications. And we try to look at every single application by the time we're done reviewing them, but we have to start with something. So ERAS has filters that you can use to kind of start with figuring out who you're going to interview and and some of those filters are they're they're things that are measurable as you can imagine so you could imagine what the filters would be you can also make your own filters but you have to be able to measure it so um geography you can filter by state you can filter by medical schools you can filter by geographic location um you can filter by board scores you can filter by what else um the, their, whether or not somebody's had a felony um that anything that it's got to be identifiable by the platform and so just think about what is an identifiable feature and it probably can be a filter so it's but it's got to be you know something that is can can differentiate um you know geography is what a lot of people use a lot of people have board score cutoffs a lot of people you know that's kind of some of the basic ones like, can you think of any other obvious ones Meg? No, no, I mean, you can you can sort by like, you know, I want to look at all of the DO applicants today. I want to look at all the osteopathic schools. I can look at all the MD schools. I want to look at USMLE. I want to look at Comlex. I want to look at who's got step one, step two. Um, you can create multiple filters. There's like layers of everything. And each program will do it completely different. Um, but um, be very transparent. We start geographically. Um, look, we like to look at all of the schools that are local to Philadelphia first, because most of the time those people want to stick around. Um, and then, you know, we'll go from there. If people's hometown is in the area, you can like search by what state they're from, things like that. Um, you can search, you can filter by failures of boards and things like that. Um, I, I think we have something like 46 different filters <laughs> that you can build and combine. So, um, you know, uh, people, most people don't have board, you know, they may have board cutoffs, they may have, you know, oh, if, if you have one slow, two slows, you can, you can have all of those filters. So, um, but every program will have different, different things. Um, so I, hope, I know that's not a great, like, this is what we do, but I hope that helps a little bit knowing that you have to sort through them somehow. Yeah, we did the same thing. We start geographic and then move out and it just, we, We'll start with like, for us, we're, you know, I'll do Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, or whatever, and then I'll expand from there. And, you know, so you just, it's just to get them in chunks. Um, yeah, 
and we have met, we matched people last year from California and Texas and Philadelphia. So, I mean, and we interviewed people from Alaska last year. So you can, you can filter however you want, but in the end, it doesn't necessarily mean I set this filter. So these are the people I'm interviewing. You filter it and then you break up those, you know, we have four people that look at applications. So those four people are looking at this chunk of applications and this chunk of applications, trying to just break it up so it's manageable for everyone. And as you can imagine it from a from a task perspective, like in from us, if you are breaking it down to having 200 applications instead of 800 applications, it just is mentally something that's more doable. So that's why we do it, you know, but we try to get through all of the applications ultimately. If you are like me when I was in your shoes and you were worried about your scores filtering you out. Um, so full disclosure, I got a 209 on step one and a 505 on level one. So there were a lot of filters that I would not even make because a lot of programs have a cutoff of 210. You can find those filters. Oh, you can find those cutoffs. Some programs will publish, publicize it on Emra Match. I also used um, Residency Explorer or Resident Explorer. I forget. It's RE something. Uh, and I used Frida. I think those were the three things that I looked up. I liked Emra Match because it would tell you when they last updated their information. So that was super helpful. And then I knew exactly which programs I was interested in that would get me filtered out. So I, I basically made a list of who I needed to make sure that they knew my name and that I was interested in to look out for me. If that is why you are asking that question, if anyone is out there asking that question, that is how I navigated my way through that. So great, great comments all around. So to clarify, yes, Dr. Hornack, I agree. You all are awesome. Um, just because you might be filtered out per se, region, step score, it doesn't mean you're completely eliminated from the pool of applicants that that program is looking at. You might just be either lower down the list or someone else looks at you, et cetera. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, it's not, it's just a starting point. So there's not a, I mean, I suppose it's possible that programs filter just, just as a potential example, you mentioned the 210. So it's possible that programs don't look at anybody who scored under a 210, period. But what Megan and I are talking about is just getting using filters to get started and then expanding from there. We don't, you know, if you, we have residents from all over the country. I mean, I'm going to eventually get to your application if you're from Alaska, because I'm going to think it's cool to look at an Alaska application and to interview somebody from Alaska. But, um, but you know, first we might look at all the Philadelphia applications kind of thing. So it's not, we're not, not looking at others. It's just, we're talking about how to start. But again, if you get, you know, one of the things that I personally do. So if I see a very low board score for level one, and then you go up significantly for level two, I look at level two. We look at boards, many of us, you know, boards don't define you. Boards predict whether or not you're going to pass boards. So boards tell me if you can take a test. And if you, or if you're gonna need help because you have issues taking standardized tests or something like that. But if I see, you know, a 410 on, on level one and then a 600 on level two, I interpret that as something happened in your life when you took level one and you, that is not you, the 600 is you because you cannot do better on the test than you are. So um, that for me, I, I would not 
ever screen you out because you have that second board score. If somebody has a filter on that screens out based on level one and you get screened out and they never look at you because of that, that's theoretically could happen. So you have to know that that can happen. And then if there's a program that you really want to go to and are very interested in, you might want to give that a heads up in an email and say, you know, I have a reason to be in your program, line one, line two, I would love to have an interview and just wanted to make sure you're aware that um, I realized that I had a poor performance on level one, but level two, I was able to improve significantly. And um, that's, it, you know, and that might let them see past the filter. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think this has been a very fruitful conversation. So um, in order to respect everyone's time, maybe take one more question, one more burning question, and then we can wrap up. I had a question. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I had a question about, I guess, kind of fine tuning our applications. Are there any mistakes that you often see students make um, on their ERAS applications? And um, are there any common mistakes that you wish students knew before submitting their application that you would like them to know now? I would just say, I think uh, something that Dr. Fernandez said at the beginning, typos, um, you know, making sure that, you know, the details are done, um, reading it out loud, like she mentioned, just to make sure things flow and make sense. Um, but as for like omissions or things that you want to make sure you have, um, I'm sure you've all looked at it in so much detail that you're going crazy right now. So. <laughs> Um, I can't think of any mistakes I've seen that really drive me crazy. I think that um, there are students that don't represent themselves completely and um, do themselves an injustice by like leaving things off that are really significant experiences like like just didn't fit something important into the CV so um, you know research for example will be empty and I'll see like just nothing or they'll say no research done or nothing done probably a significant portion of the and I see that a lot with DO students because there's a definitely more of a push to do research in allopathic schools and osteopathic schools from my observation from the applications. Probably you did something somewhere in college or med school that is some kind of research or a research interest or something like that. And you probably have something to put in there. Um, you don't have to have a PubMed publication in there. It can be, you can put in a talk that you gave to a Boy Scout troop in your hometown. You can put, you know, a talk that you gave somewhere else. Um, be creative with what you have in your background and make sure that you put it all in there because it, you probably have lots of good things that you did. You made it through medical school. You're probably an overachiever. You probably have done very cool stuff and that stuff is going to be interpreted as significant. Um, here's a clear example that I don't think, uh, I'm not gonna name names, but a student that I was actually talking to today had a, um, a trip abroad in college where they did really significant stuff that was, um, it wasn't like a, a healthcare thing. Um, they actually trained with students in this country and 
and did a really cool thing. And it was nowhere on her CV. And I said, this is really a fantastic experience that you need to talk about and you need to put it on your CV so people ask you about it. And she didn't know where to put it in her CV. And we talked about that. And, um, you know, think about everything that you've done and make sure that you're giving yourself credit for what you deserve credit for. That's very helpful. Thank you. You guys are going to be great. You have made it this far and just think about where you were even just six years ago. And it is incredible that you are here and you keep going and you keep showing up, especially to things like this. And I think if you're showing up for things like this, you're probably also doing a lot of other things to help yourself out. Be proud of yourself and be yourself and you're going to be okay. I think with that, we will end this session. So just a few closing notes um, as everyone is leaving. Um, our next panel, if I can pull up the date, our next Women's in EM session is going to be on October 21st, and we are going to be talking about crushing interviews. So as you all are submitting ERAS, make sure to come back and register for that session. And um, this recording will be posted. So if you have any friends who um, need this, this wisdom, feel free to um, direct them there. Um, and finally, we're always interested in your feedback. If you have any comments, concerns, feel free to email us at info at aaem.org. And we look forward to seeing you at the next session. And thank you all to our panelists. You're all wonderful. I just stuck my email in there. If any of you guys have questions, please feel free to shoot me an email. Um, there are, it kind of irks me that there's some osteopathic students that just don't have good mentors available. And um, that's why we're here quite honestly. So don't hesitate. Um, we have our jobs because we love to mentor our students and residents. And um, I am happy to try to answer your questions if you have any. So um, feel free to shoot me an email.